How many people in here have um, read B for B, one of the books we did? Just raise your, let me get a sense here. Okay. So, so that book was, if you can believe it or not, um, 11 years ago. And I would assert that it is just as relevant. If you pick that book up and you haven't read it, I recommend you read it. Um, not because I want to push in books, but it's just 100% relevant today. And for those of you not familiar with the key framework, basically what we asserted all these years ago is that technology providers like yourself, whether you're selling hardware or software, that there was a migration going on in our business models, our value propositions, and we were moving from left to right. So a lot of us had what we called level one, level two supplier models. What does that mean? You're super focused on the product. You're super focused on you know, the technical differentiation. Um, you're pretty service light. Um, you, know, you love partners and resellers to deal with all that mess. And those models are, we love them because they're highly scalable and historically they have been highly profitable. But customers have been dragging us off of those supplier models and this has been going on for a while. And what do they want? They want business value. We all know this, right? If it changes your business model, whether you like it or not, so what happens? You start you know, focusing not on feature functionality, on value realization. To get the value, guess what? You have to get into these ugly things called services <laughs> and you have to help the customer. And so we have these what we call level three supplier models where you are starting to operate the technology for the customer, manage services, things of those, those things. Level four supplier models, you are really driving business outcomes. So I, I think everybody intuitively can agree, I mean, this is what's been going on, right? Then after that, a couple years ago, and you go out to the portal, you can find this. We did a paper called Your Mess for More. How many people have seen this paper? Okay, so anybody, anybody, who is, feels like you're in a level one, level two supplier model, you have a lot of equipment, it's not connected, and you're on a journey to do more as a service, to get things more connected, gotta go read that paper, okay? It's out there. And in that paper, we just put more meat on the bone in terms of when we talk about that journey from left to right, what's going on? Well, this is a busy slide, but the, the, the thoughts here are, are not super complicated. The first move on the chessboard is you go from having disconnected product that you sold, you don't know what the customer's doing with it really, to, oh my gosh, phone home, I can talk to it. <laughs> I know what's going on. I have some telemetry. That's a step forward, right? And then you start saying, well, maybe I can do some services for that customer that they don't, no longer have to do. So think about premium support. Think about a managed offer now, right? Then, you could basically say, and, and people have been doing this with on-prem software, and when the customer starts saying, I want like a SaaS type of deal, and you go, oh crap, I don't really have a SaaS kind of deal, but I can <laughs> manage that for you offsite in, my, in a data center just for you. How many people are doing that? That's a very common you know, migration path, right? And eventually you may end up with some offers that are truly multi-tenant in the cloud SaaS. Does that migration make sense? Okay, software companies, historical you know, on-premise software companies have been chipping on this for the past you know, seven, eight, 10 years and have made a lot of progress, right? So if you look at an SAP or an Oracle or an Informatica or anyone who's been around for a long time, they have been eating through this journey and sometimes they stopped and they did a managed hosted offer. Some of them just went all the way over to SaaS. Most of them to this day still have really a lot of the, these flavors in play. So if you look at a legacy software company, they're typically not, oh yeah, I'm all SaaS over here. They still have some on-prem, they have some connected on-prem, they have some managed. It's complicated, right? The th other thing about this is it's really hard for hardware companies who start this journey with disconnected on-prem equipment and they wanna get on this journey to do this, right? How many people can relate to that? I was looking at some of the questions from the sessions where people are like, yeah, how do we do this as a service thing? And this is so hard. And part of it is, you know, you don't even have a chunk of your customers in any type of service relationship at all. Not even a basic support contract, right? So it is a hard journey. 
and it takes a long time. And the initial format for today's session, because the most common question that I personally receive, if I, and any of our researchers receive, if we're talking to a company, has on-prem hardware disconnected, they want to go on this journey, we tell them why, we tell them it's happening, we tell them the value propositions, and they sit there, and you, you know what the number one question is? Show me somebody who's done it. Show me, point to a hardware company, Thomas, that went from over far left and got all the way over here, and they did it, and they came out the other side, and they weren't dead. Tell me, <laughs> show me that company, all right? Because my boss needs to see that. My CEO needs to see that. My CFO needs to see that. Okay, well, part of the brutal reality is we say, look, we, there's a lot of companies that are chipping on it. But there's, A, they're not in a place to talk about it publicly yet because they're not super successful with it. And so it's a work in progress. And I'm, I'm sorry, I can't really point to a lot of companies that have done this. That's the brutal reality. But there is a company that has made some real progress on this that started far left and they got to the place that you're seeing right here. They went from disconnected equipment um, to a place where it is now a managed offer, right? It's connected, it's, it's still on the customer site, but they're doing all the operational um, activities around that and unlocking new value propositions, which is why the paper we wrote is called Your Mess for More. Not your mess for less. This is not outsourcing. This is not financing. <laughs> this is not leasing. This is building incremental value propositions in an as-a-service posture. The company who did that, made this progress, and was willing to come here and talk about it, was Philips Healthcare. And unfortunately, the executive who we've known for years and has spoken to other members on their progress and was going to tell her story, Jamie Osborne, had a family emergency. She was actually here in Vegas, and she had to leave. She had to leave. Um, but being who we are, we, we, we can tap dance through this. So what we're going to do is we are going to play a video that Jamie had provided, which it, in, uh, I want to give you some perspective on this video. This is an internal video they used to explain to the company, right, why the hell they were doing this, <laughs> right? Because all of you are who are on this journey, the biggest hurdle you're facing is that first, like, people don't want to do it. Why do they not want to do it? You know, we want to sell and get that money up front. We don't want to take on this complexity. This is a pain in the butt. I mean, it breaks our financial models. It breaks, we don't have the service capabilities. There's all these reasons not to do this that creates this inertia and keeps you anchored on the far left. Can people feel that are experiencing this? Yes? So this is a video. Just think about this playing to your employees, to your executives, explaining why why in the heck do we go on this journey? So that's the context for this. Uh, why don't we go ahead and roll the video here. Quite literally, every monitor we sell has a patient connected to it and dependent upon it for the best outcomes. For many years, Philips has been the acknowledged leader in this market, with a premium product offering and commanding install base. But in 2015, warning signs began to emerge, threatening business as usual. Commoditization was putting pressure on our margins. Pay-for-performance offers challenged our traditional business model. The growth rate for traditional product and service offers was flattening. We knew that challenges to our business were rooted in the challenges our customers were facing themselves. One could not remain healthy without the other. We resolved to solve our business problems by solving the customer's problems and defining our market for the future. To find answers, we brought together a Philips team of customer, product, and market experts to look at challenges and opportunities from all sides. We crave partnership. There are too many dump and runs. 
A la carte pricing is very frustrating to get us what we need. There must be better business models that let you serve us versus nickel and diming. Since major changes in technology began eight to 10 years ago, it's never slowed down. We've never really had a chance to catch our breath. I don't think we do a good job with continuing education and retraining at all. And a part of that is that we don't have the resources to do it. Asking how Philips could better answer these customer needs, we found inspiration in the trend towards solutions being offered as a service. A powerful concept for driving business model innovation began to emerge. Could offering monitoring as a pay-per-use model be the solution to both the Philips business problem and our customers' problems? For every key customer need, enterprising monitoring as a service presented a better way forward. Standardized technology and management, seamless integration, ongoing education and support, data-driven improvements and partnership, predictable operational expense, all delivered using a consumption-based price, reflecting the patient-driven economics of our customers. EMOS held competitive advantages for Philips, too. Predictable recurring revenue with higher customer lifetime value, lower barrier to entry with increased stickiness and greater wallet share. As EMOS ticked the boxes, we knew we were onto an idea with the potential to transform our business. A true light bulb moment illuminating the path forward. Our case was strong, but to test it, we asked dozens of customers about the potential of EMOS to solve their most pressing challenges. If what you're talking about is gonna solve all my problems for me, then yeah, I'm interested. I like the idea that Philips wants to do more for us. The more they heard, the more they liked. But they also challenged us to be even clearer. Can any vendor really pull this off? If this is another lease or financing option, I'm not interested. In sum, show us what EMOS actually looks like and what it can do. Not satisfied until we could satisfy customers' questions, we iterated further. We fleshed out the service journey, features, and packages, showing how customers would benefit from ongoing, day-by-day -day value creation. And we worked with independent experts to ensure EMOS met the requirements for true service accounting. We again asked external and internal customers to critically evaluate EMOS. All 23 of them said they were interested or highly interested. I would rather pay Philips a million dollars per year to just take care of everything we need and cycle everything through. The features included rated as medium to high value, and their overall average value was 2.5 out of 3. With that, we knew we'd successfully redefine the future of monitoring with an as-a-service model. Of course, if you want to see if an idea really has value, go get a customer. Backed by a rigorous process and a compelling customer vetted brief, we made our case and won. June 2018 was day one in the real world for EMOS as we signed our first customer, Jackson Health System. We now have several years of on-the-ground experience and the results are strong. We've proved a new sustainable revenue stream that advances our quadruple aim. Most importantly, we have a happy customer who has benefited from our ongoing engagement and a partnership that delivers continuous integrated value. Our partnership provides the ongoing support and proactive management we want for a life-critical capability that we rely on 24-7. Our solution was proven to be desirable, feasible, and viable. And still, we continue to prove, to learn, to evolve and validate. Every new insight equips Jackson to get more out of the solution, preparing us to scale and release EMOS more broadly. Almost all 30 respondents from a multinational survey would seriously consider sourcing monitoring as a service. It would be something that we would look at. If this was successful and spread over a lot of institutions, the cost might even be less than what we're paying now. The overall offering is extremely interesting. Hats off to the manufacturer that came up with this concept.
We're really looking at managed services much more closely now, because they do have a value many times in the way they're supporting these things. And we continue to have an active funnel of prospects with a value of over $150 million. We have a powerful customer verified and market tested story to tell and to sell about the future of enterprise monitoring as a service. Now it's up to us to tell the story, drive the change and seize the opportunity. It is how we ensure a healthy future for our business and our customers' businesses, and most importantly, for the patients in their care. So that is a classic story right there. It started out with, guess what? We are, you know, we've been a leader here with our product. We're facing margin pressure. You know, it, we, we're, revenues are slowing. We need a new playbook here. And customers are asking us for more help. How can we unlock more value? So they're monitoring as a service does that, okay? Can people relate to that story as a hardware because Can you just see yourself facing those same things? Okay, so um, he here's part of the punchline. How long do you think it went for them to go from, we're facing pressure, maybe we should do a new model, to the place where they are today, which is they just, they did it, um, you know, they tested, they you know, did, did the market research, they said, okay, great, we're gonna do an alpha and prove it. Now they've come through to the beta stage where they now, just now, want to release this to the broader base market beyond uh, the Jackson system. How long do you think that took? Two years? How many people think more than two years? How about more than four years? Anybody think more than four? A couple hands still up? Eight years ago, I flew to Amsterdam to meet with the executive team of <laughs> Philips to talk about why as a service was a thing. Eight years. People ask us, you know, all the time, um, you know, how, how long is this going to be? A couple quarters. Here, do we have the, oh, let me go back here, sorry. This is their, their timeline here that you can, you can see. And again, 2024, they are now just getting ready to announce this into the broader marketplace. This is a long journey, and they did it really well. They funded it, they kept chipping at it, but this is a long journey. It's the right journey. <laughs> it's the right journey. Because if you don't go on this journey, what you are gonna face, I personally guarantee it, because we track the financial data of technology companies every quarter, is your revenues are gonna flatline, your margins are gonna go down, and eventually you're gonna wake up and go, what the heck just happened to my business model? That's the path you're on. Slow motion liquidation is the path you're on. This is not easy, but it, I think for most of you, it's non-negotiable. So that is, what I'll do is I will get Jamie on Tectonic and um, I'll interview her there and you can hear her story. Uh, there are some really good lessons learned in terms of how they funded this. So one of the biggest things that you all face is how do I fund standing up a new business model? And what Phillips did is they treated that like a venture fund. They carved out money and they said, okay, here, Jamie, and this is what her job has been for the last eight years. Here's some money, go do the market research. Is that a go or no go? Came back, oh, market research, pretty positive. Okay, can you find a pilot? Here's some money for a pilot. Okay, let's, can we be successful? To, okay, here's money. So she's now just getting in the phase of getting a big chunk of change to take this out. Make sense? And a lot of companies struggle with that, you know, that incubation piece of it. So what I'm going to do now, since Jamie's not here, is I'm going to bring up uh, our latest researcher, a gentleman named Roy Dockery, who just joined us. He has deep expertise in field services. He is spending um, time with our industrial equipment uh, members. And so he's very dialed in to the challenges here. And so I'm going to interview him in terms of things that uh, he's facing, and then um, and we'll, we'll, we'll go from there. And I think, Roy, can you join me out here, sir? Give it up for Roy, come on. <laughs> All right. I thought maybe you bailed on me. I, you, you just took off or something. <laughs> Take a seat. Okay, so I think they have our, our questions lined up here somewhere that I can take a look at them. I don't see them yet. Here we go. Um, but the, I'll tell you, the first place to start, and I showed that diagram 
of the journey and starts on the far left where you have you know, equipment that's disconnected. And one of the challenges I think you see is that there are a lot of companies with on-prem equipment that they don't even have a basic support contract in place. So they have no <laughs> service relationship. So what's the data show there? Like, what do, what's that look like? How many people are in that boat? Yeah, so the interesting thing is, is that there's a, there's a bucket where it's zero percent. And I think, you know, I joined TSA a couple months ago, and that was surprising to me for an equipment manufacturer to, to actually report from a benchmark perspective that it's zero percent. But for those that are doing contracts, it actually ranges from one percent Wow. being covered under, um, of the install base being covered under a service contract up to 95% yeah. with an average of 47. Yeah. So like the average across like industrial equipment, um, which includes healthcare technology and other providers as well, it's the average is 47%. Mm -hmm. But like I said, that goes from one all the way up to, to 95. And, uh, and we're seeing a lot of, and the equipment manufacturers are, a lot of them are on the lower end of that spectrum as well. Yeah. So Val Galowski uh, has, did a framework uh, several years ago for industrial equipment type companies that are trying to go on this journey and you're describing his zone one, which is, you know, we barely have customers in a service relationship and that's job number one if you're on this journey. You gotta start basically getting good at connecting customers with a service relationship, basic support, premium support. It is, I would say, damn near impossible to say, look, we don't even have that muscle and we're just gonna jump into an as a service, you know, world yep. and be good at that. So, so that's interesting. So, so what, is, is, what do you see as, as organizations start, like Philips did, wanted to start this journey, what are some of the, the biggest rocks that you consistently see in the way? Yeah, so and you, and you mentioned one. One is just how do you condition the customer itself, right? Because uh, you have a lot of industries and customer bases, um, and we've talked to some of our members about that, that it's just a break-fix kind of industry, mm -hmm. right? They set aside money to pay for something to get fixed when it's broken. So some of it is just the ideology of the customer itself to, you, you know, enter into a relationship, sign a service contract, allow us to work with you more collaboratively to be preventative, Mm -hmm. And don't just pay us large amounts of money when the equipment breaks, <laughs> right? Like help us help you like maintain your uptime. So I think one is you've got a challenge and you know, you've got some free and everybody thinks everything's under warranty, but it's really getting customers. And I mentioned this in the advisory board meeting, like trust me with your emergency budget now, mm -hmm. right? So they set money aside to pay you when it's broken. So I'm like, give me that money now <laughs> and I'll stop it from breaking, right? Because the, the issue isn't the budget because a lot of them wind up spending more money with us on demand yeah. than they would if they just had a, a structured service agreement and they would experience less downtime, which is cost for them. Um, so I think that's one and then- And, and, and let me, I'm gonna yeah, pause sorry, you right go there just because that's a, it's, it's a super important one. I'm gonna put two things on the table there in terms of changing the mentality of the customer, right? And that's, again, uh, this phrase of your mess for more, that's your North Star here. Because if you're coming in and you're saying, hey, I've got these new services and blah, 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 it, it's like, okay, but what is the additional business value to me? And so in Philips's case, um, you know, monitoring as a service took them from saying, you know, look, let's just keep these monitors up and running to, you know, we're gonna work on the efficiency of the equipment. Is it being utilized? Because hospitals want stuff to be utilized, Yes. right? Do, do the people who are working it know how to work it effectively? We're gonna help you with adoption. And it's ultimately gonna lead to better outcomes, which is patient experience. And, and so when you start to connect the dots that way and you start saying, that's why you're gonna pay me in this relationship, not just, you know, keep the lights on. That's n number one. The second thing I'll put on the table I was talking to an executive um, about the fact that they're getting to the point with customers that are in like this bare minimum break fix support relationship, right? And this is a service leader. And he says, like, I go meet with our, our biggest, largest, you know, customers that are for whatever weird reason still in just that kind of relationship, yeah. right? And he said, look, that's not, we don't even want to be in that relationship. We want to be in a relationship with you where stuff's not breaking because we know what's going on, right? We have all yep. these other service capabilities that you're never calling us for this. This, you know, this is, this is not really the type of value proposition that makes sense to us and it shouldn't make sense to you. Yep. So I think, so your number one is spot on. You gotta first recondition the customer, but you better bring the goods in terms of what the value is. Okay, sorry, number two. 
Yeah, and so number two is, and we, you know, we talk about telemetry and field service and support service, it's the connectivity because when you, even you know, looking at Phillips with the example, with monitoring as a service, there are a lot of things that they could track. They could see utilization, that you, know, you could probably identify a nurse or somebody that needed additional training to make sure all the functions were being utilized. So in industrial equipment, I think one of the challenges has been is that we have connectivity to the system, mm -hmm. right? And so a lot of us, we get machine data, we can get performance data, we can see alarms, but when you start transitioning to as a service, I need to have data that's giving me an indication of when performance is declining, mm -hmm. not an alarm that told me it was already broken. Yeah. So I think one of the things that's missing in some, in, in some industries and with some equipment is that you need connectivity to sensor data and not just to the, like the, the main computer or the, the system right, that's telling you, like, I have an alarm, I'm currently down. Yeah. Right? So I think the connectivity is beyond just like the main operating system, and, but we also need um, sensors and connectivity to things that tell me, you know, I've been running at a higher than average temperature, right? I've got more voltage being pulled from my motors than I expect. So then when you start getting to as a service, and it's like Phillips, right? Like you need to be able to monitor your own equipment yeah. to be able to sell that. And I think what I saw when I was in healthcare technology, that was one of the challenges because our, my system told me when it was down mm -hmm. and I could respond quickly but I didn't have anything early on that was indicating to me that there was a decline in performance. Yeah. So it's less value to your customer. If you're, still, if you're just gonna respond when it goes down, mm -hmm. why am I paying you more money? Because I could just call you, yes, right? So if you can't prevent it from going down, yeah. so I think the connectivity has to be coupled, not just with the alarm data and the, and the performance data, but you need the sensor technology within the equipment as well that's giving you that indication that there's a decline in performance and then you can monetize the, the predictive maintenance, the, you know, like the prescriptions yep. to improve performance yep. versus just a quick response. Like a lot of us are trying to sell a quicker response as a service yeah. where you don't have to respond to the alarm, I'll do it. But the problem is to the customer, and, I, and, I, and if I was in that seat, I'm still getting the alarm. Yeah, it's like I don't want the alarm at all. So, so I'm gonna jump on that in, in the sense that what that puts on the table is that when you start this journey from left to right, it is everybody, it's cross-functional. So one of the other common mistakes is that the service organization, you know, so, we're, so you, know, you start the basic you know, support, premium support, whatever, but if the service organization says, you know, we're gonna go after you know, monitoring as a service, and we're just gonna go do that, they're never gonna get there. Because why? For at least two big reasons. Number one, the product, to your point, is probably not doing the things you need it to do. So if the product team's not prioritizing the features that are gonna be required to unlock these value propositions, you're screwed. So they gotta be all in, there's gotta be funding for that and get that, you know, that priority. The second thing who, who has to be on board is finance. <laughs> because you're changing, you're gonna change the way the money's coming in, yep. it's gonna break their systems. So you quickly learn, and this is what I, said when I was in Amsterdam when they wanted to start this journey and, and all the, you know, everybody's there from the executive team and you say, look, you have to understand every one of you is going to be impacted by this in terms of your departments. This is the cross-functional and I think that's another thing that executive teams at hardware companies, this is a completely different animal. They yep. don't have this expertise, it's nothing wrong, you know, it's just, they just don't have it. And so it is a journey they have to go on to understand all the moving parts. So that, so that's r really important. You gotta get the, you know, everybody else on, on board as well. Yeah, and I think what's important about that, so when you talk about the product side, I've mentioned this, I know I, I actually did a session on supply chain uh, immediately before this, and we talked about it in our advisory board meeting as well, because I asked the question, how many of your organizations, the product team, how many organizations service is a product, mm -hmm. right? So service is a product that's attached to any piece of equipment because what you find is that service becomes a contract, right? Like it's a, it's a legal document that's like an extension of warranty, but we don't think about it as an actual product. So when you're trying to transition and you mentioned it, people will just be like, well, I'm gonna just go start taking this contract and I'm going to do it more dynamically and sell it as a service, but it's not tied to the product. It's not tied to the product lifecycle management. So one, in that relationship with the product team, I think you get the most value when the organization and, and some of our, our, our larger companies on the advisory board, they say like, yes, like we're at the table during the process. So if I'm, if I'm launching a new system, mm -hmm. there is a product for that system that is going through that entire process. Yeah. 
right? Whether it's documentation, the go-to-market strategy, the, the, the demand planning, the material, it's all there. And so I think that helps. And when you talk about finance, I, I, you know, you talk about the journey. I think the other thing about the journey as well is that you've got you've to forecast that journey for your customer mm -hmm. because your finances are going to change, but you're asking them to go from CapEx to yep. OpEx. Yep. And some of them, it's going to take them three years to do that. They just yeah. can't allocate $2 million that they were going to spend on equipment and then give you $250,000 this year and $250,000 right. next year. So, and even when you look at Phillips, the length of that story as well yep. is that while you're going through that journey, I think companies need to make sure that you're communicating that that's the direction we're going into and you have to start preparing your customer that they're going to have to spend money differently as well because if you wait and when you present it to them, it might take them two or three years yep in budget cycles to switch. So you've been preparing it for five, yep. and then now you're, you know, it's not gonna be able to be delivered for eight because you've gotta start um, kind of evangelizing that transition to your customers as well. And that, I mean, that should be in the voice of the customer, right? You should be seeking their input on what product you wanna develop for them as a service, but then also let them know, we're not gonna sell this as CapEx, it's gonna be OpEx. Yeah. And so as you walk forward with them, it'll, it'll be hand in hand. So that helps with finance and on the product side. Yeah, I mean, it, it, you bring up a fantastic point, which is it's not only the fact that you're going through a journey on your business model, which is hard, you are reconditioning the customer and you're changing their financial model. And again, all these things we're talking about is why you end up with these five, six, eight, 10 year journeys to do this stuff. And it doesn't yes. happen in, you know, in a quarter or or two. The, um, so what, let's see what else we have around questions because I'm going to give the audience here a chance as well. Um, so we talked about the, the collaboration with the product teams. Um, any insights there on how to effectively get them on board integrated with this journey? Anything you've seen there? Yeah, I think the, I think the main thing that I see, and we asked this question in the field services benchmark as well, is that you have to be formally involved in the process. Right, you're not brought in after it's developed. You're not brought in in the last minute when we're beta testing to say what would a technician do or, um, or how would the service be impacted, but you're, like, you're a part of the formal process. And I was talking to a, a member the other day because we ran into this issue in, in my previous life and then we, you, know, you get to go to market and like now I'm trying to come up with the service strategy mm -hmm. for completely new technology in the 11th hour. So what we did in the overall um, life cycle management process, like there was a service approval at every state. Mm -hmm. So like if you had stage one, service would come to the table and said, yep, that makes sense. We have an understanding. We have the documentation that we need. We've been involved. So we were one of the checks along with marketing and sales and yep. um, and product. And so I think when you formally integrate the field service or the service organization or support organization into that process, then um, it just, right, you ask different questions, right? You're gonna ask about yep. training, you're gonna ask about spare parts, you're gonna ask about material and distribution yep. and, and all of those things. And so I think that's the best practice that we see is that you're not an afterthought in the process, like you're formally involved and then there are, are tangible and planned handoffs and and like certifications from the field service organization yeah. and from support services yeah. that this is how we're moving forward, right? So because of, uh, other than that, it's just, it winds up being reactive and we get brought in when you're drafting the proposal yeah. because again, services looked at as contract language that, that's at the end of the warranty versus another product that's, that's running parallel with yeah. the, the, the so new thing that's being developed. Yeah, and so if I build on that and, and, and this is again, you put a really good thread on the table. So if you look at a company, again, if you're far left, disconnected product, very small service business, it is, it is the afterthought model. So it's like, oh, hey, by the way, we're releasing this new product next month. You probably want to put like a basic, you know, warranty contract around it or support contract. You know, the, you, you're, you're getting notified almost after the fact, right? Yep. And, and that's fine in that, well, not fine, but that, you know, that's, it works. When you get into this world, you have to have a structured offer development life cycle. Is, which is what you're describing. And so it's like, oh, we're thinking about this new product. Okay, well, what are the service components? Do we have the capabilities? Do we have the telemetry we're gonna need to do this? And what you see is, if you look at enterprise hardware companies that um, are, are, are B2B and they're more service intensive, so they have big support businesses, they have a professional service business, they might have a little managed, then they have this in place. They're used to this, right? Yep. And so if they wanna get even more aggressive with as a service, it's a little bit easier. When you don't have that in place, 
it's you you basically again you got to say look as we go through this pilot we're going to also be piloting <laughs> our offer development life cycle so that we do have these checkpoints because otherwise you that model that w worked before of just throwing it over the wall from here's the product release is is no bueno in 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 this you know as a service world for sure yeah and one thing i'll add to that and the reason that that's a challenge especially when you talk about large support organizations with people is that one of the reasons that you know you want to transition to as a service because it lowers the cost of entry and all of this other stuff so if you sell it and it's successful mm -hmm. we haven't planned to actually support it yeah right so the the the, the rate at which and i you know in the last organization right i had to scale up i had to triple the size of a field service organization for a startup mm -hmm. right because if people actually start buying it as well then you haven't planned and we're not you know, we're not standing alongside you throughout that process. We don't have the technicians. Yep. We don't have the support personnel. And so what winds up happening is you have this ramp up, but then you have a significant backlog. Yeah. And for me to work through the backlog, now I need to hire more people. I need to, and that's why even, you know, a lot of organizations are struggling as well. So I think even the support side of it, not just the contract or the product itself um, as a service, but the, the support for it. So like, yeah. if you do this and it picks up and it does really well, you're going to have a lot of frustrated customers that thought it was going to be quick turnaround mm -hmm. and that this was a new thing that you were investing in. And then when it comes time for like the rubber to meet the road, you don't have enough technicians to goods. deploy it. Or you start sacrificing your existing customers, <laughs> right? And then, and then taking on all the projects and the installations and then your CSAT drops, right? So then your future uh, customer base that you would want to sell into, now they're all upset at you because right. you had to ignore them to take on the new customers because you're not planning for that labor and support increase as yeah. well. Yeah, no, I totally get it. Let me, um, let's cut over to see if any questions came here um, before I ask you anything else here. Um, tracking, let's see here, how do you, how do you shorten the as a service transition timeline? Um, there's a couple things I'll put on the table there. And again, these unfortunately, I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you two things that will shorten it and you're gonna hear them and you're gonna go, yeah, we're not gonna do those. <laughs> okay, what shortens it? Investment. Funny. Investment shortens it. You, like everything you're talking about, hey, we're gonna hire ahead for these support people. We're gonna hire, we're gonna invest in new product capabilities. We're gonna hire some more product you know, developers. So there's a check you have to write. And the bigger check you're willing to write is gonna help compress this timeline. See, I told you you didn't wanna do that. <laughs> s s second one, the second one, which is, um, and George is sitting here in the front <laughs> row, and him and I have been in, God, I don't know how many sessions we have delivered to leadership teams that are trying to go on this journey. And what we tell them consistently is that organizational structure matters. If you're really going to stand up and as a service, you actually need to carve out a separate organizational capability, and that's their day job. All they're doing is worrying about how, you know, if we're, we're really going to start to pilot this, so we've done our market research, now we're going to pilot, whose day job is that? Like, Jamie, this was her day job, right? And yep. then she had, re so, you know, you have to have dedicated service people. You probably have to have some dedicated product people. You're going to have to have eventually dedicated, you know, sales people. And so why do people hate that, in that answer, even though we know definitively that is an accelerator? Because of the historical power base. So think about this. Let's go to your current product leaders, your current sales leaders who are selling all the product, right? They own the revenue, they own these big P&Ls, and somebody comes along and says, yeah, we got this new shiny thing over here, and we're gonna carve it out, and we're gonna take some of your resources, and, and it's gonna report over here. How does that go over? <laughs> like a fart in church. That's how that goes over, <laughs> right? And so those are the two accelerators, and, and they definitely work, but I would say that, you know, the vast majority of companies will not pull the trigger on those. They, they get nervous on the investment, and they don't want to mess up the org structure. They don't want to take anybody off, so they just say, well, we'll have them work part-time on this as-a-service stuff and part-time on their day job, and it doesn't get there. No, I'm curious, I, what, have you, what have you yeah, seen on that I, one? I 100% agree, and I mean, you know, my, my last, last two years was at a, a unicorn startup, and what they had no shortage of was money. Yeah. Right. And so coming from a company that was 100 years old in healthcare technology, where it took three and a half years to get approval to buy a field service management platform, like I could send an email and spend two hundred fifty thousand dollars in a day. Yeah. Right. I could mm -hmm. I could just say I'm going to hire 27 technicians and they're like, wonderful. 
right? Because <laughs> their because their entire yeah. business is geared around that that it, investment. So yeah. it definitely shortens that time because yeah. there there are things that you need to do. But like you said, you can strategically do it, but then you also know like how fast you're willing to move, right? Yeah. So when you see that momentum, but it definitely takes investment, but then also the organization structure, right? Like that's what I was brought in to do. Yeah. They're like, we need you to come in and build us an organization. And I literally built it. Yeah. And I was like, put more money into it and now I'm going to go. Yeah. Because it's like, it's running, it's there. Um, and you know, in the engines, in the engines field. But no, I 100% agree uh, with both of those. And yeah. people don't like it, but it's it's true, right? Yeah. If you want to do something different, you've got to invest in it. Um, yep, and dedicate. There's another great question that came in here in terms of, and I'd be curious your, if you have any uh, experiences here. Best practices for overcoming customer objections um you know to going to basically sort of this new new model and and one of the things you have to tell the customers to do is hey we want to you know connect we, we need to be getting telemetry off of your your equipment and if they that's never been happening before the customer goes whoa 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 yeah you know what are you doing there so what what have you seen on that what I, best practice is do more upfront than after the sale and so what we would always find healthcare technology for, for 12 years, right, working pharmacy automation, material transport, the hospital doesn't want to let anybody within their firewall. Mm -hmm. But what we would do is we would sell to the facilities department, we would sell to the pharmacy, and then when we're installing the equipment physically on site, that's when the IT department gets brought in. And they always hated that. Mm -hmm. So what we started doing from a, uh, that we found to be very effective is we're like, with our customer, this is going to be a lot more painful but we basically developed like an IT deployment guide for the hospital mm -hmm. and said, hey, this is what we're going to do. This is why we're going to do it. And so what you wind up getting is you get like a champion in the IT department during the pre-sale process, during the, so that you already have somebody that's answered all of those questions from you. Yeah. They know what questions to expect on the other side. And so that device is coming into the hospital as an asset versus it coming in as like a third party and then you trying to go through the process of getting it on their network. So I think the earlier that you involve the IT department, even though the customer's not going to like it because they know that the IT department is always oppositional, mm -hmm. it would be, it's better to have those frustrating conversations up front before you sign a contract because all of that winds up getting pulled from the productivity of you being able to execute on the back end, which is gonna frustrate your customers. So it's like, get involved with the IT department up front, have an IT document that answers all the difficult questions, and you know, obviously, obviously you got to stay away from protected data. Like this is machine data. I'm pulling temperature. I'm pulling alarms. I'm not touching your customer information. I'm not touching patient information. I'm not touching right. PHI. But you normally hit a wall because they just see a request for you to connect to their network, and they have no idea who you are or what you're doing. So I think the earlier that you introduce that in and go through their IT management process, like once the contract is signed, the opportunity is won. Everything, everything goes a lot smoother. So I think that's yeah. been a effective what I've seen. And I'll build on that. The other thing that, that we always coach people in this question, this is a question that comes up all the time. You know, customers don't want to you know, connect. And that is, you have to give them the why. Yes. If you, you know, if it's like, hey, yeah, we're going to have this you know, pipe going, and they go, and IT comes along and goes, no, 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 no. You said, no, well, wait a minute, there's a why. And what is the why? It's going to be about uptime. It's going to be about all these other things, right? And so to unlock these value propositions, which your business people really want, I have to have the telemetry, yeah. And then you and then you go through the you know you're, you know ticking all the boxes to make yeah. It and that's one of our even when we in our, in our field service benchmark, one of the questions that we ask is like, do you tie SLA entitlements to connectivity? Yeah. And that's some of the reason. Like, I want to give you a better service. I want to be able to dial in within a few moments of you reaching out. I want to be able to have automated responses from your alarm. So a lot of that is in that is in that why. And when you ask, well, like, again, when you put that up front, it yeah. kind of it kind of removes some of those obstacles or at least slows it down so that once the project is closed, you can execute and you don't hit a bunch of delays that wind up pushing back your, your customer's timeline. Yeah, and the final thing I'll put on the table here is, is we're winding down on this topic, is reality is these customers you're talking to, they've got a bunch of connected stuff somewhere already because there's other technology yeah. providers that have connected, they're getting telemetry, they're providing these services. And so if you're getting the pushback, you, you say, look, this is not like unprecedented. Like, you know, yeah. nobody's doing this. This is going on all the time. So we are out of time. I really appreciate the, the good questions here. I wish I could have got to more of them. Hope you enjoyed it. Again, I'll interview Jamie and we'll get the rest of the story out there. And uh, we'll see you hopefully this afternoon for the closing session. Thank you. Thank you.